doesn't stand All right. a chance when I well, what a blessing. We get fed, too. How cool is that? Yeah, Calvary Chapel. You guys are awesome. So, uh, last section. Um, applying a biblical worldview. And as mentioned before, we've got a whole bunch of other sessions in here. And again, if you want to get the four DVD set in this, just email me. I'll send it to you. But so, um, when I was chatting with Doug and Ryan and others, you know, like, hey, let's get in and how do you take this biblical worldview that we kind of covered the most important parts, which is Scripture, who is God, who is man, what is truth, you know, kind of this, this comprehensive biblical worldview, the basics, the very basics of it. Now, how do we take that and then apply it to all these issues that are going on in our culture today? So, can we just pray? Because this is kind of a big topic, right? And I want to do, do it justice. Lord, I just thank You. Father, thank You for Your heart Thank you for, again, Calvary Chapel. I do just pray blessing over our time this afternoon, Lord, this last session. Lord, I just pray that your Holy Spirit would guide and direct it, and you would just give us supernatural wisdom from on high and how to engage in some of these really inflammatory hot-button topics. Lord, how can we be a light for you um, in those times? And Lord, help us to do that with the right tone, the right manner, with just speaking the truth in love. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so um, how do we do this? So first, there's some principles I think we need to follow when doing this. So we've all done this just recently. We'll do a quick review of worldview, talk about, you know, how do we do unity but yet not compromise on the truth, and then these steps to evaluating and Here's the list, right? Who is Jesus? Who is man? Who is the Trinity, inerrancy, COVID-19, or the role of government, you know, Marxism, racism, you know, critical race theory, sexual immorality, just to name a few, right? There's some hot button topics in there, right? So we're going to try to cover all of these. So (laughs) this is overwhelming. So, uh, but we're going to try to cover all of them. And this is not, you know, the other parts of my talk, I really try to weave in, you know, some stories and Um, uh, some videos and all of these things. So, this gets just right down into it, and we kind of stay in it. So, bear with me. You guys just had some food, so don't drift off. So, we did the worldview. (laughs) We did the worldview thing. We understand what a worldview is, you know, Palmer's thing. But let's talk about this concept. So, you know, ecumenical, ecumenism. Uh, It can be a bad word, sometimes. And it is if it means you're compromising the truth of the gospel. You know, the Reformers, and even going back further, there was a phrase that they came up with. They said, unity on the essentials, grace on the non-essentials, and covering over all agape love. And so, this, this, I think, really captures the heart of God for unity. You can't read passages like John 17, where Jesus prays for all the people who would come to a saving knowledge of the truth, you know, for these past 2,000 years. He prays that we would be one. He says, and then He goes on to say this, just as you, Father, are in me and I am in you, I pray that they would be one. And he's five times in John 17, he prays that all believers would be one. And he twice he gives the reason. He says, so that the world will believe that you sent me. Unity on the essentials, I think, is absolutely critical to effective evangelism in our culture, in the Portland area, you know, wherever. Now, we know there's a whole lot of division going on, and that's very difficult right? So, um, so I think striving towards unity, but then, you know, we have unity in the essentials. When someone compromises on the essentials, what are the essentials? Jesus is the only way. The gospel needs to be central to, to the church's mission. If the gospel is just about social justice and just doing works, you're losing what the point of being here on earth is and, and being a light for Christ. You are to do good works, They just need to be done in the name of Jesus to bring glory to God. Uh, And so, 
so we lovingly divide when someone compromises on the essentials. So I think that's an important part, and I think there's a healthy word of ecumenical, which is we are striving, as Paul says in Philippians 1.27, striving side by side for the gospel of Christ. And so there are a lot of Bible-believing churches in the Willamette Valley and right here in the Portland area, and praise the Lord that you guys, you know, can partner with them uh, in the gospel. So, I just think that's an overarching principle with these issues. Now, how does that get played out? Any issue, I think there's three things that we all need to do, three steps. Step one, and not, you know, in order of primary importance, but step one is sort the issue. Is this a salvation issue? Is this important in partnering together in ministry? Does it affect our ability to share the gospel? I'm going to give you examples of those. Step two, search the Scriptures. Be a Berean. You know, anything I say today, search the Scriptures, right? Not with a heart to go, oh, I want to find what that that stinking Stephen Williams coming over here, you know, speaking, I'm going to find something that he's saying wrong. Um, probably not really what Jesus was talking about when He said, you know, love one another and be a Berean, you know, but yet search the Scriptures. You should be searching the Scriptures in anybody's teaching you about anything. Search the Scriptures and then seek, thirdly, seek wise counsel. You know, you've got Pastor Doug and Ryan and Liam and other amazing Holy Spirit-filled people here at Calvary Chapel who can help guide you through, you know, some of these nuanced issues. So, sort, search, seek is always when you look at any issue. So, let's get, you know, down into it here. Let's give, I'll give you an issue where it's a salvation issue. Who is Jesus, right? It's a salvation issue, to be sure. It's, yeah, I am not going to partner with another church, ministry, group that completely, you know, and when I say partner, I mean locking arms together and saying, you know, we're doing this for the same purpose, you know. Y- you, can, you can superficially, you know, do something with, you know, some of the things, but I'm talking about when you say partnering, you know, yeah, it's, this is going to be an issue if they don't believe, you know, the same Jesus, you know, I'm not going to partner with Mormons or with Jehovah's Witnesses, you know, we would say, no, that's error, and so we're not going to partner together. Search the Scriptures on who is Jesus. And you guys, we went through a ton of these things. Seek wise counsel. All Bible-believing Christians will affirm the importance of this central issue of our faith. It's in Christ alone that we can be saved, all right? So, that's, that's, a, that's a clearly, right, uh, a central essential that you would lovingly divide if someone disagrees on who Jesus is. Oh, Jesus is just one, you know, example of God. There's multiple paths. Um, no, that's, that's error and that's not accurate. And so, you would, you would lovingly divide over that. How about another one? Who is mankind? As we talked about, who is man, right? That's a big one. So, yeah, it's a salvation issue. Yes, you would, you would not partner with people, you know, uh, and does it affect our ability to share the gospel? Of course it does. It is essential to the gospel, who is mankind, you know. So, we talked about that. And again, all Bible-believing Christians will affirm the importance of this central issue to our faith, that man is imago Dei. I mean, as there's absolutely, we, ha- we are created in the image of God. Every single person is. So, there's special, you know, we are special. Humankind is special above all other creation. However, we're separated from God, and it is through faith, hope, and trust in Jesus Christ alone that we can have a right relationship with God. So, that's a central salvation one. How about the Trinity? Again, yes, you know, now there's nuances, um, but yeah, this is a salvation issue if, say, you know, Mormonism or Jehovah's Witnesses even, or others, you know, who, who would say that Jesus, you know, denies the divinity of Christ, well, that's a salvation issue. And so, that's a big one, right? Of course, it's going to impact partnering. Of course, it's going to impact, you know, the sharing of the gospel. Search the scriptures, scriptures seek wise counsel. Again, there is there's huge, overwhelming evidence. This is why we've had this Trinitarian view of the Godhead from the first century, you know, to today, right? Because it is throughout um, the Scriptures, even Old Testament stuff. So, it's a, it's a very important issue. 
Inerrancy. Now, this is interesting. So, I believe that Scripture is totally infallible. It's inerrant. It is totally without error, right? But is this a salvation issue? In other words, can you be saved and believe that there's some errors in the Bible? What? Yes. I mean, I think you know, very clearly that you can. Now, I would be very cautious, hence does it, does it impact our ability to partner with others? Yeah, absolutely. You know, does it affect our ability to share the gospel? Well, maybe. It depends on where, where you think the Bible is in error, right? If it's on just some superficial stuff, okay, fine, maybe we can still partner and do some stuff. But if it's on some central stuff to the gospel, no, you know, we're not going to partner you know, uh, or have effective ministry. Um, with the gospel. So, the, so we're, do you see the nuance here? So, we're getting into some things on, on, is it a salvation issue? Well, not necessarily. It's a critical issue, and I would only partner with groups and organizations that affirm, you know, that this Bible is without error. And again, I think there's good evidence to show that. Okay, now let me get into one that's completely the opposite. Do you have… what is your view in the public school system? right? So, should kids, should kids be in the public school system? There are many who say that you're in sin if your kids are in the public school system. Yeah, I, think, I think we need to be very careful. Now, first, let's break it down, sort it. Is this a salvation issue? No, right? Yeah, like whether your kids are in the public school system or not is, is not a salvation issue, clearly. So, how is it important in partnering together in ministry? Generally, no, but I would say potentially it could be if someone's really dogmatic, you know, either way, like, like saying to, to the point maybe you're in sin if your kids are not in public schools. Every child in the, in the body of Christ needs to be in public schools to be a witness in the public school system. Otherwise, you're in sin. It's like time out, right? That's like extreme. So, you know, that would be possibly, I, I would be very cautious partnering with someone who declares that. <clears throat> Does it affect our ability to share the gospel? Well, it shouldn't. Your view, this, remember, this is your view about having kids in the public school system. This is obviously not a salvation issue in other of those. So, so um, search the Scriptures on this, right? I mean, there's, there's tons of them. Proverbs, uh, you know, um, 22, Psalm 1, uh, Colossians 2, I mean, Colossians 2, 6, right? Therefore, as you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him, rooted and built up in Him, and established in the faith, just as you were taught, according, uh, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving, see to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. I think that's foundational. If you have your kids in a teacher's classroom in elementary school or whatever, where that teacher is, let's say, a passionate um, New Age person. Let me give you an example. So, I'm teaching down in Cupertino schools. How do you know where a, t or where a teacher's worldview is coming from? It's obvious, okay? It's totally obvious. You can go and ask us at a school, any public school today, virtually any public school today, if you go and say, hey, who are the, the Christian teachers? And I kind of want my kids with those Christian teachers. And who are the ones who are like not Christian, kind of hostile to it? It's pretty simple to find out who they are. And then virtually most principals today, if you say, I want my kids in this teacher's classroom, the Christian ones, you know, coming from a more biblical worldview, most principals today will honor that and say, okay, fine, I'll, I'll listen to your request and plug you in there. Not always, but if my child in the public school system… So, I go, uh, you know, we do these in-service days as a teacher. So, I go to this other, other school in the Cupertino School uh, District, and… Um, go into the classroom. I sit down. I'm like looking around like, going, okay, great. You know, everybody's here. And it's like an in-service day. We have to be here. You know, it's all boring teaching. And so, I'm just doing this checking boxes. So, I'm looking around as a Christian. I'm looking around the room. This is after I was saved. Um, and I don't see an American flag. And then I go, flag of Mother Earth. And then I look up and I see this Pledge of Allegiance to Mother Earth 
straight up, right? And so I read this thing, and it's like, oh, I pledge allegiance. You know, it's like total new age, right? Spiritism, right? And so I'm like sitting there like, wow, you're like really bold, you know, about this stuff. So in our book, Navigating Public Schools, we say, get your kids out at all costs. You do not let them in an elementary school with a teacher like that. Why? They're in that classroom seven hours a day, 1,600 hours, right, a year. That teacher is having more influence on your kids than you are. They're spending more time with your kids than you are. Not necessarily influenced. You guys are going to hopefully have a lot more influence even spending less time. But that teacher's spending more time with the kids than you are. Of course you should say, there's no stinking way I'm going to let my kids, you know, get indoctrinated like that, you know, five days a week, you know, the whole deal. So, I digress a little bit, sorry. But so, my point here is, is with this get wise counsel, see, first search the Scriptures, you know, it's your responsibility to train up a child in the way you should go right? And so, so we need to take that responsibility and, do, and then get our book. If you're ever like, well, should my kids be in public schools or not? Get our book, okay? Because it is very important to understand what's going on. So, any quick questions on, on the school thing? I know that could open up a whole Pandora's box. Maybe I won't do that. Forget it. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. So, uh, here's another Pandora's box, right? Dealing with COVID-19. All right, so is this a salvation issue? Good, no. You know, is this important partnering together in ministry? Generally, no, right? Whether, whether there's, you know, church, you know, with masks or no masks or, you know, do we, do we wear some masks because some other people, you know, there's a whole, and Pastor Ryan, and I'll bet you guys, man. So I'm the president of our Ben Ministerial Association. We have a really rock-solid you know, Evangelical Bible-Believing Ministerial Association over in Bend, and thankfully a lot of the churches over there are super solid. we got a great statement of faith. You can look it up, bendministerialassociation.org or .com. Um, so anyway, um, man, has this year been interesting. I got pastors coming in going, you know, people are going ballistic on me because, you know, somebody was wearing a mask, right? People are like ripping me apart for not wearing a mask. And then these are like unfire Christians who would be more Bible-believing even there is passionate on both sides. Can I get an amen? <laughs> yeah, right? I mean, so I, it's like, wow, people are really fired up. Like, masks are of the devil. And, you know, if, if you don't rip your mask off, you know, you're in sin, right? If you don't put your mask on, you're in sin. Well, we need to, like, I think just tone that down just a little bit, okay? This is, a, this is not a salvation issue. Anyways, um, so uh, are we okay with that? Are you guys with me on the whole dealing with COVID-19? Yeah, it's, this is whew, weird times we live in. So I'm going to kind of fly through these initially, and we're going to get into some more, uh, you know, some really some hot-button ones that we will take a lot more time on. So don't think I'm just going to fly through all of these. Role of government. Okay, is the role of government, right? How, what is, role does government play, you know, in our culture according to a biblical worldview? Is this a salvation issue? No, obviously not. So, is it important in partnering together with ministry? Well, again, probably not, but potentially if you feel the role of government is as, as Abraham Maslow said, right, and, and as John Dewey uh, said, the father of our modern education system, if you think the role of government is to, like, you know, train up these, these citizens who will just obey government and do, well, well yeah, okay, that's a problem, okay? We're, that's not cool. So, anyways, go to the Scriptures, search the Scriptures. Romans 13, right? The greatest passages on clearly defining, you know, some of that. But yet, that's not just the end of it, right? I mean, Paul defied at times government. Peter, right? Far be it from us to obey you, the governmental officials, you know, when he said, stop talking about the name of Jesus. He said, we have to talk. You know, so he's defying government officials directly at times. So, so there's, there's, go to scriptures, seek wise counsel, right? There's, there's, 
uh, Doug Brandau wrote a book, Biblical Foundations of Limited Government. He says, in general, government should provide the legal scaffolding that allows people to try to collectively but voluntarily solve their problems. And so there's great resources, great pastoral help right here at Calvary Chapel. If you're struggling with, you know, what do we do? with the, How much should we submit to the governmental authority? And where do we then say no to that governmental authority? And mass and all of these vaccine passports and, you know, all this stuff is playing into it, you know. And so, I thank the Lord for, for Calvary Chapel Southeast that are like, hey, we're cool. We're going to be great citizens, right? But there's some lines which we're going to say, no, this is, you know, you're going too far, right? And we're going to take a stand here and say the government has gone too far. And so we're going to take a stand publicly for that. So I praise the Lord that Calvary Chapel is willing to take a stand, you know, for the God, yeah, for the gospel and for Jesus and the role of government, okay? Some other wise counsels, summit ministries, understanding the times, uh, government's proper role is maintaining the rule of law. And then they, they go on to talk about any form of government intervention has been the attempt to equalize people economically through confiscating wealth and restri- redistributing it. In the 60s, it's very interesting, President Lyndon Johnson declared a war on poverty and committed billions of tax dollars to develop uh, welfare programs, build housing, and buy food for poor people. Get this, after the federal government spent trillions of dollars over the past several decades, the poverty rate rate today remains almost identical to as it was under um, Johnson in the 60s. So how did that go? at throwing literally trillions of dollars at the problem. Not so much. However, you guys know, when you're able to mentor and disciple people and have some, you know, relationships that they come to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, and they start learning biblical truths that, that the Bible says, if you don't work, you don't eat. There's, there's consequences. And so, when we come in, in, in as, you know, sometimes and say, oh, well, I just want to help are we helping or sometimes enabling the problem, right? So we need to be wise and help disciple people. You know the old adage, you know, you, you don't just give them fish, you teach them how to fish, right? You, you help train them. So that's a biblical concept. And then these, these are interesting slides here, and again, I don't want to go into this too much, but uh, Abraham uh, Kuyper, a Dutch theologian, um, came up with this concept of sphere sovereignty, that, um, that, that God and Christ is over all, including the state, that would be the government, that's the church, family, marketplace would be, uh, you know, um, all businesses and all of that, charity, doing good works, acad- acad- uh, acad- academy is school, all schooling, and society, those are all spheres they're, that are influential, and they all have their own sovereignty within them, but everything is Christ. Now, what you kind of have <clears throat> in this concept, in this worldview today, is instead of Christ, you know, one nation under God, the, look, the founders got this. If you go back and read the writing of the founders, that's why that was our initial, our national motto is, is one nation under God, is, is founded in that, in that Christian worldview. But now, you're having more of the state is taking over that place of God as far as sphere sovereignty over everything and then the dysfunctional stuff that happens because of it. So that's kind of a little bit of role of government. Star Parker is an Afro-American woman who's just brilliant, Bible-believing. She wrote a book called Uncle Sam's Plantation where she shows how the welfare system is enslaving African Americans and minorities into this system, and she says, this is, this is totally messed up, and we need to, like, you know, break this. So, role of government. All right, I'm flying along here. Is everybody, we cool? All right. How about Marxism, communism, and socialism? All right, now we're getting into some stuff. <laughs> so, is this a salvation issue? No, right? So, what's your, what's your view towards some of these um, can you be saved and still be a socialist? Yes, you can. 
right? So, is this an important issue in partnering? Yeah, yeah, this is going to be most likely. I probably should have said potentially, um, but it, I say yes. Does it affect our ability to share the gospel? Again, potentially, okay? If you are basing your worldview that, that it's social justice and, and all of it, you know, um, uh, is about works mentality and just providing for people and doing good works is how, you know, we restore things. Well, yeah, that's, that's a sal- that gets to a salvation issue even. So, it could be a salvation issue depending on your view on, <clears throat> on some of this. So, search the Scriptures. Um, again, 2 Thessalonians 3, for even when we were with you, we gave you this rule, the one who is unwilling to work shall not eat or Philippians 4. I am not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry. And then Acts um, 4. I don't know there's a whole bunch of Scriptures, and I could dig into this um, more, but the point being here is Marxism, communism, and socialism is a completely different worldview, and why do I put them all together? I'm going to explain that in just a minute, um, because some of you would say, well, socialism is totally different, you know, from communism and Marxism. Eh, not so much. So, we'll get into, I'm going to show you why that is, but um, whether it's Scripture in these areas, but, but seek wise counsel. So, um, we have written a whole blog on this, but Marxism does not take into account the sin nature of humankind. Marxism, remember Karl Marx, the Communist Manifesto, he clearly said, look, the greatest evil in all of the world is inequity of of goods, of economic, you know, things. And so, there's the rich and there's you know, the poor or the the working class. And so, it's up to the working class to rise up, overthrow governments, and instill a more socialist, communist form of government which will redistribute wealth so that everybody has equal outcomes, regardless of what you do work-wise. Okay, that's a totally opposite worldview to a biblical one where Paul talks about if you don't work, you don't eat, and some other, other places like that. <clears throat> so, the danger posed by a flawed human nature is exponentially greater in a communist or socialist system because the government in that system becomes too powerful. So, what you have, and this is exactly why the founders… Now, you go back and read about why we came up with this form of government, this limited government with checks and balances in the United States of America. That was revolutionary at the time. Nothing like it was tried before in the history of the world. You had monarchies with the typical governments. You had a democracy that Rome tried, you know, two, well, 1700, whatever, you know, years ago before that, and it failed miserably. Straight democracies fail every time. Because if you get 51% of the people to say, well, yeah. I want that person's money. You just pass that law and take their money. So, democracies always create class warfare, always. And so, the founders were totally amazingly brilliant, and I think most of them led by the Holy Spirit, um, when they came up with this form of a constitutional republic under God. That's very important. So, we came up… Get this. The United States was the found is, you know, the, the, the premier starting entity of coming up with this, this checks of balances, three different branches of government to check one another. The most powerful branch is the legislative branch, and then the executive, and then the judiciary. But they were all there under God, right, it, to, to ensure the rights in the Declaration and Constitution that all of us are endowed by our Creator with certain unalienable rights that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And if you go back and read what the pursuit of happiness was, it's the right to own property without being taxed, actually. And so, um, this, this, this 
this, yeah, being able to own businesses, properties, you know, run, you know, this, this entrepreneurial spirit that allowed people, you know, to, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to work hard and, and, you know, try hard and Lord willing, I'll succeed and all these things. That was very much an Amer- that was part of the American dream. And it set the United States apart from every other government that had been tried before and, and all the monarchies that was going on. And then notice, What's the, the main form of government today around the world? Anyway, it's parliamentarian. It's, it's, and that's exactly, you know, a copy of what we did. And, and so all these other countries now are saying, oh, well, we just need to change from a monarchy or from a dictatorship or from… and we just need to start, you know, so for, for, for a few hundred years, you had all of these countries adopting uh, you know, a government like ours, but ours is a little unique. We have the Declaration and Constitution, and we said we're one nation under God, under the one true God. Now, you didn't have to believe in God to have all the rights of a United States citizen. And actually, you had Jews, Muslims, Hindus coming to America in the 1700s and 1800s because they're like, I want to go there because they're going to protect my right to, to worship God, the way I want to worship you, had all these non-believers coming to America because they knew that we were the land of the free, and you know the the, the believed in these these rights, the the Ten Amendments, right? And the what's the first of the first um, amendments in the Bill of Rights? The free exercise of religion, right? Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise of religion. That's the first of the First Amendments, and that was there intentionally because they knew that every, all the other rights would come from that right. Ooh, I digress. I'm getting fired up. So, um, <clears throat> seek wise counsel on this. There's um, you know, Marxism is an atheistic and materialistic worldview based on the ideas of Karl Marx. Um, it, uh, it promotes the abolition of private property, public ownership, um, and, you know, and, and the utopian dream of a future communistic state where ever the government redistributes wealth perfectly to all the people, and then they don't need anything, and that's the utopian state. But it completely misses the point that the more power you give someone in government, Scripture's pretty clear on that, how's that going to go? Not well. Why? Because we have a sin nature, right? You could have… Now, that's where people go back to, well, look at Acts chapter 4, right? Acts chapter 4 said all the believers had everything in common. They were of one heart and one mind, and they were like giving everything to anybody who had need. And you'll hear a whole bunch of false teachers in the body of Christ saying, see, that's where socialism is good. And you're like, no, that was all voluntary, right? It's literally all voluntary helping each other out. And that's a great thing. I bet you right here at Calvary Chapel, there's people going like, hey, you know, use my boat. Hey, you know, you want to do so. There's people working together for the cause of Christ and doing it, but that's all voluntary. And socialism, Marxism is not. It's mandated. Communism is the Marxist ideal of classless and stateless utopian society. Socialism, an economic system based upon governmental or communal ownership of the means of production. So let me, some people keep saying, oh, well, socialism is different. Um, so from, this is from Summit Ministries, from a Marxist worldview, basically it's all about the redistribution of wealth. If we could just get that right, we would have a utopia. The only salvation we really need is salvation from the exploiters, which can be achieved by their overthrow, even if that means violence. And then the Hoover Institute has come out with some good. The largest American socialist party uh, is the Democratic Socialists of America, DSA. According, and by the way, uh, um, uh, Talib, um, AOC, um, they're part of, of this, um, open members of, of the DSA. Um, according to the Hoover Institute, a staff writer for a DSA House publication could not be clearer. In the long run, quote, democratic socialists want to end capitalism, that's the ownership of, of property and capital, we want to end our society's subservience to the market. Two members of Congress and media, AOC and Tlaib, are, are members. So, yeah, so just look into it, do your research, get some wise counsel, 
and that'll, that'll help you out. Now, here's an interesting one. You know, should Christians be involved in politics? Right? Here's the interesting one. So, first of all, yeah, be involved in politics. No, it's of the devil. Get out. You know, don't, you know, so is this a salvation issue? No. Right? Is it important partnering? Possibly. You know, does it affect our ability to share the gospel? It could, um, depending on where they're at, you know, in that view. So, again, search the Scriptures on whether Christians should be involved in politics, and I'm not going to spend as much time on this one. Professor Wayne Grudem, you've probably heard him, he's, he's arguably one of the premier theologians of our day. Um, he wrote a massive book called Politics According to the Bible, and if you want to sum this up, he says, of course Christians should be involved in, involved in politics. Come on. Now, you, now he is go and read it, and you'll, you'll see. He's, he has a very biblical way. I mean, if you talk about someone applying the Bible, Wayne Grudem really um, is a brilliant man with that. So, uh, let's end that one. Social justice versus biblical justice. Let's take a little time on this one. So, is this a salvation issue? Probably not. Um, you know, you can have different views on this depending on the extremity of those views, but probably not. Is this important in partnering? Yeah, it very well could potentially be, again, depending on if, if you think that social justice becomes more important than the gospel. Well, yeah, that, that's, that's a problem. Does it affect our ability to share the gospel? It, yeah, it can potentially. So, uh, Isaiah 1, you know, learn to do good, seek justice, reprove the ruthless. Uh, defend the orphan, plead for the widow. You guys know the Scriptures. There's no question that we should be about biblical justice, right? Matthew 22, you know, what's the greatest commandment? You know, um, you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength. This is the greatest and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. And remember then, the Pharisee says, well, who is my neighbor? And Jesus then like just totally in amazingly God wisdom graciously sticks it in their face, you know, and says, this Samaritan, you know, whom you hate, who you think is a subhuman, he is loving his neighbor more than this Pharisee or this, you know, these, these legal elites, you know, in their religion. Um, so, anyways, uh, James 1.27, your religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. <clears throat> so, let me take this cough drop because I'm not used to speaking for five hours in one day. But what questions? Do you guys have any questions on, on some of this stuff? Mm -hmm. um, there's a, obviously the debate between socialism and capitalism and free markets. But if you look at the free markets and capitalism of, say, Jeff Bezos or Bill Gates and George Soros and the pharmaceutical industry, it doesn't look too good. So could you speak to the moral aspect of capitalism and free markets? Mm. Excellent question. Can I speak to the moral aspects of capitalism and free markets? Has anybody seen the, um, um, oh, I totally just blanked, uh, the movie um, Doug, Douglas, um, uh, the greed, greed is good. Um, somebody help me. Wall Street. Wall Street. And what's, D Douglas, what's his name? Michael Douglas, thank you, sorry. So Michael Douglas, right, I mean, plays that role stunningly brilliantly, right? And that kind of, I think that's the epitome of your question, you know, where he comes out just this horribly corrupt, you know, capitalistic greed is good, you know, kind of this totally warped concept of what the Bible, I think, teaches pretty clearly, that free markets and the people to the, have the ability to work for a living and to own property and to own businesses, and the opposite with socialism and, and cap, or communism, Marxism is more that, that they, they directly don't want people to own property. But so I was an economics major at Berkeley as an atheist, and so I kind of get this, you know, micro, macroeconomics and free markets. And, and so free market capitalism, I think, is, is a very 
biblical understanding. You don't have to agree with, with this. This is a non-essential issue to salvation, and even with you and partnering together. But I think the free market system that the founders created um, really allows for people to flourish in that entrepreneurial spirit if they have, you know, some sort of uh, idea that, you know, I can, I can provide this that is of value to culture. So what the concept of free markets is it's both in supply and demand. So, so if you have a free market, what it's allowed to do <clears throat> is you have many suppliers. So let's say you make bread. Hey, Bob's Red Mill is right here, right? Let's, you, make, you make flour, right? So if they're the only producer of flour, then they can set the prices. But if you have a free market where people can choose between multiple different suppliers of that product, then those people are just going to go to the place where they can get a quality product at the lowest price. And so what that does is it drives ingenuity, right? It's an, in, it's an incentivizer to make a good product. Whereas, let's just contrast the opposite, in, in a monopolistic society, which, which in communism, they make all the flour and they set the prices. So in that society, are you going to have an incentive to make a better product? No, there's no incentive to do that. Now, that's the opposite extreme. So free markets really allow, it drives, I think, innovation. It drives, you know, ingenuity. It uh, allows for, and, and then the same way, not just in the supply, but in the demand side. So, I don't know, does that help with a little bit? Mm. Because of cheap labor. So, what went wrong there? Mm. Man, I mean, we don't have time to. Um, <laughs> yeah, you got a couple days, let's break it down, you know, and like what's happening. And so, but that's what the rule of law is for. If, if a culture, if, if a capitalist, you know, Michael Douglas type of person is like greed is good, that's what laws are for. That's what you, you say, you know, stealing is bad, you know, embezzlement, you know, this is why um, um, blanking, 55, man, I can't remember anything. Who was the dude, uh, Michael, he was, uh, the, um, he was arrested like 15 years ago uh, for embezzlement. Bernie, Bernie Madow, Bernie Madow, right? So this, this is what the rule of law is for. When these people are doing bad things, you arrest them if they're breaking the law, and that helps keep the, the greed, the sin nature in the free markets. That'll help keep it in check. I don't know. All right, let's get on to some of these fun stuff. Social justice versus biblical justice. No. All right, how about racism? Black Lives Matter. Is that a controversial one? Woo! <laughs> okay, so is this a salvation issue? <clears throat> no, most likely not. Is this important in partnering together? Yeah, it very well could be. Does it affect our ability to share the gospel? Yes, it very well potentially, depending on where you are in this spectrum, you know, of beliefs. First of all, racism is a sin. Crystal clear. I mean, there's no debating this, okay? Uh, the, the people who debated it in the South were wrong, okay? And we won that war, okay? We went to war over this. Okay, we're going to be visiting Gettysburg on this trip. The most number of American citizens who have died in any war in this nation's history, in fact, if you add up every single person who has died in any other war other than the Civil War, more died in the Civil War than all other wars combined, we have the blood of these people, right? We just celebrated Memorial Day. All these, these fathers of, of, of us fought, bled, and died for this cause that racism is a sin, and we won the war, okay? That was defeated, right, a hundred and, right, a long time ago. And then they still had the Jim Crow laws, and they were still trying to, you know, kit racism in, in, instilled. And so what happened then? You had amazing faithful Christians like Martin Luther King Jr. and others. You said, you know, I have a dream, ladies and gentlemen, that one day my children 
right, will not be judged on the color of their skin, but on the content of their character. And yet you're being told today that that's all bogus. You have to judge people on the color of their skin. That's insane, okay? All this is doing is breeding racism. Critical race theory, hear me, is the most racist theory in our culture today. How crazy is Antifa is the most fascist organization we have in America today. Anti-fascist, right? You know, it's, just like, it's, it's like really weird. It's totally like, wait a second. Somewhere in Scripture, it talks about this, right? As we get towards the end times, right, they're going to call good evil and evil good, and like everything's getting turned up, isn't it? Turned upside down. I have a question on that. Yeah. Mm. How, we are called peacemakers. Mm. How do we diffuse that and show that I'm on your side? I agree. Racism is wrong. And together, in partnering, we agree in that. So let's move back to character issues and not skin color issues. Yeah. We have a good community that we all agree we need to build and make strong and stable and yeah. not be dismantled. Yeah. That we can't right. So, they said, how do we engage that sort of just intensity, that wokeness, that culture that will just ruthlessly go after you? If, you know, if you say that, well, I don't believe in critical race theory, you know, you'll get canceled, fired, you know, all these things. <clears throat> I think we need to be educated on what it is and what it isn't. I think Vadi Bakum's book, uh, Fault Lines, is brilliant. This is coming from an African-American brother in Christ who is brilliant and who clearly articulates the roots of, of critical social justice and the undergirding worldview, which is critical race theory, which talks about exactly what Marx said in the Communist Manifesto, that the greatest evil in our culture today is the disparity of wealth among the people, and you need to get the, the, you know, the oppressed you know, lower class to rise up and take over um, the other, is exactly what's going on today in the area of race. They're saying that, you know, well, anyways, I digress. Let's get into some of this. We'll, we'll talk about it here. So first, search the Scriptures. As I said, racism is sin, right? James 2, but if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. Galatians 3.28, there is neither Jew nor Greek right? It's just, you go through scriptures and all of these, there's, there's no question that racism in any way, you know, is, is a sin and should be. So, it's plain and simple, important to make the distinction between black lives. So, let me just talk here about, about this, this concept, wise counsel. So, um, Dottie Lewis is the author of Advocates. He says, are you willing to call any division that is caused by racism discrimination or prejudice uh, or prejudice a spiritual and moral problem? Are you willing to call it what it really is, sin? Are we together willing to call it sin? So I think that's very important that we do that. But then Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, right? Returning hate for hate multiplies hate, adding deeper darkness to a night already devoid of stars. Quote Martin Luther King and when you're doing it. Darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate only love can do that. So, how do we lovingly engage people who are really deceived by this? I think it takes great prayer, great, you know, being led by the Holy Spirit. There's great resources out there, you know, whether it's Lifeway or Vadi Bokum or all sorts of, you know, the, uh, Pastor Ryan and Doug can probably get you guys some great other resources. But let me take you to the, to the Black Lives Matter organization. <clears throat> Two of the three founders of Black Lives Matter are committed Marxists. We do have an ideological frame. Myself and Alicia, those are two of the founders, in particular are trained organizers. We are trained Marxists. Okay, Russell Berman, professor, this is at Stanford University, right? Senior fellow at Hoover Institute. Noting Color's declaration of being Marxist trained, quote, one has to take that seriously. If the leadership says it's Marxist, then there's a good chance they are. But this does not mean every supporter of BLM is Marxist. So I think just understanding the nuances 
you know, of it is going to be incredibly important. And then praying, you know, how do you engage with this? Um, you, you know, the, the righteous indignation that, that supposedly be, is being declared over this issue is almost a little bit, well, it's shocking, but yet when you consider what else is going on as far as immorality in our culture, and more on that in just a moment, it's really um, stunning. So, for example, let's, let's, I'm going to get back to um, that in a moment. Immigration. Whew. <laughs> okay, here's another one. Is it a salvation issue? No. I mean, can it, can it impact partnering? Sure. Does it affect our ability to share the gospel? Hopefully not. I mean, it could, depending on your view on this. But <clears throat> let me just, just try to break it down that, look, we are a land of immigration. And when you really, well, you know what? Yeah, we don't have time to go into this too deeply. Watch this. Look at this. Illegal aliens um, in the U.S. is 10.5 million. Lawful immigrants. We have 35 million in, in naturalized citizens. Okay, and then lawful permanent residents. We have 12 million, and temporary lawful residents, 2.2 million. Just look at some of these statistics. In 2017, there were 35 million legal residents who were born in a different country and 10.5 illegal uh, aliens. More, more than one million people immigrate to the United States legally every year. More than virtually any other nation around the entire globe. Okay, this is very important to remember. Over 3 million refugees have legally resettled in the United States since 1980. Again, that is definitively more than any other nation in the world. Okay, more people immigrate here legally, and then more, we take more, more refugees who are saying, wow, I'm getting persecuted over here. About 30,000 refugees legally enter the United States every year. So, when someone comes at you, right, and they're going to come at you with this narrative, oh, closed borders, and, you know, you're, you're, you're letting all these people suffer, and, and we're not taking them in, and we're not allowing them. It's like, hold on. The United States is the most open, gracious, you know, country allowing both refugees and legal immigrants into our country than virtually any other nation in the entire world. So I think that's powerful in and of itself. So just quoting some statistics can be super, you know, helpful. Department of Homeland Security, U.S. Immigration, Customs Enforcement, ICE, they had about 350,000 illegal aliens are deported, are deported every year at the border through ICE operations. Um, almost half are convicted criminals. Sanctuary city state laws, we are right here, a sanctuary city. Bend, Oregon is a sanctuary city. The state of Oregon is a sanctuary state, right? They actively stop the federal government from enforcing any ICE laws even against convicted criminals, okay? So in 2019, there were about 270,000 enforcement re removal operations. Those, what were they removing now? Who, did they, who were they removing? 91% of those initially arrested were, were arrested, they were criminals, in the interior of the United States, not just at the border, and subsequently removed had criminal convictions or pending criminal charges at the time of their arrest. 2,000 for homicide. This is not like some just, oh, that's just, that's just a one case, you know, two thousand were murderers. American citizens are being murdered by people who are here illegally, and when ICE comes to say, no, you need to be deported, you've got the Portland mayor, you've got the Bend you know, City Council, you've got these people protecting murderers and saying they're more valuable than you. Okay, the, I'm, this is just the stats, right? Now, that's just for murder. 1,800 were for kidnapping. 12,000 were for sex offenses, rape, 
molestation, child and adult. Okay, this is not like some just outliers, right? Okay, this is happening way too often. 45% was for violent assault, 74%, 1,000, you know, for driving under the influence, drunk driving. You know, people are being killed, you know, through drunk driving and all these things. So what's my point? Yes, we, we are a nation that is open for legal immigration, but yet we're, we, you need to have the stats to understand. And, and many times people come at you without the stats and they just throw these like, you're ripping you know, families apart and doing that. That's bad. We should not be ripping families apart. But we also have rule of law and it's really important to obey the rules. You know, and so there's, and then go back and if you look at some of my, um, my scripture <clears throat> references here, and again, get the PowerPoint. I'll send you this whole PowerPoint. Sign up on the email list out there. The scriptures talk about this. Well, don't they mention the alien in the Old Testament? Yeah, they do. And the aliens were, <laughs> they had to obey the laws, you know, in the nation of Israel. They weren't just free to, like, do whatever they wanted to. In fact, they had to keep the Sabbath. And if they didn't keep the Sabbath, it was really bad consequences. So, and that was for aliens, too. Anyway, <clears throat> so those are some stats. I think it's important to understand um, the stats. But if you want, I'm going to just wrap it up here. Let's talk about an issue that I think there should be righteous anger over in our culture, which is sexual immorality that was stunningly pervasive in our culture. Or how about abortion, right? I mean, or how about human trafficking? In our backyards, Okay, there is an estimated 200,000 people are trafficked within the United States each year, most for sex. $20 billion is spent in human trafficking every year. A child is reported missing every 40 seconds, 2,000 per day, 800,000 per year, right? These are, just, these are just stats, right? You want an issue where there should be righteous indignation over, where you say, yeah, God, there is righteous anger. Now, we as sinful human beings, myself very much included, a recovering type A, you know, I, am, I think we need to not go into that. Be careful not to go into man's anger, right? Be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry because man's anger does not bring about the righteous life that, that God desires. But if there's ever an issue which we can all agree upon that there should be righteous indignation over its over human trafficking. So, in conclusion, and then we can do some Q&A and wrap it up. Um, how do you apply hot-button topics? How do you apply a biblical worldview? You sort the issue, right? If, if it's not a salvation issue, you, know, you would just, you know, you, you don't divide. You try to work together, strive for unity, search the Scriptures, Seek wise counsel. Avoid the extremes. You got liberalism on the one pit, you know, on one side where it's like, yeah, do whatever you want. No big deal. You have legalism on the other side. You know, tr try to know the issues, understand what's happening, and, and strive to keep the unity. But yet, we will divide over when they start compromising on the essentials. Again, grab a book. I went and grabbed our whole box of books, so we got a bunch more books out there. I'm sorry I'm out of those. Again, uh, email me, I'll send it to you, and I do this, you know, as living. So, would if the Holy Spirit stirs in you to give something, um, the cash and the thing is fine, but we'd love to, I'd love to stay in contact with you. If you can donate online, that's great. You write a check to prepare the way, or you can text to give, you know, whatever way. Please take, before you leave, please take this little half sheet it says, you know, um, please prayerfully consider ways to partner with us. But at the bottom of this and on the back is, is what I really value, which is your feedback. Give me your feedback. I always want to make our talks better. So please tell me a couple things that I did well and tell me one thing that you'd like me to do different or how we can improve. And I always listen to those, okay? So please fill this out um, and, and take it home. Uh, write it out, and you can mail this in or scan it and email it over to me, um, however it is, but that would be a huge blessing. So, let's close in prayer, and then, because um, I think we, did we announce a 1.30 end time? So, it's 1.30, so 
give me, please give me grace. I went two minutes over. Woo. But let's, let's pray, and then I will hang out as long as you guys want and answer whatever questions you have. But let's pray. Lord, oh, I thank you, Father. Thank you that you didn't leave us here with, with just a head knowledge of the truth. But Lord, you sent your Spirit to live in us, to empower us, to enable us to be your hands and feet. And Lord, I again praise you for Calvary Chapel. I thank you for everybody coming today in this strategic location of the country. Father, would you enable and empower us to live out our faith, to represent you well. And I pray that we could bring a logical defense, a rational argument to all people that we come in contact with at work, at schools, in our neighborhoods, communities, throughout this Portland area, Lord, and beyond. Help us to be a light for you. And I just pray people would come to a saving knowledge of the truth because of this day and because people are fired up to go represent you well. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Brother. <laughs> cool. Wasn't that great? Let's stand. Not only do you do this, you're, you also, you're also a senior pastor. Mm-hmm. Or, yeah? Yeah. Of a local church in Bend. Yeah, Bend Community Church, Little House Church Network. Wow. Yeah. It wasn't, that was just incredible. Man, oh, thanks, what, a, man. what a worthy... Way to spend a Saturday. Ooh, I like, hope I so. Mean, I, I pray. Yeah, I pray that. Yeah. Thank you, brother. Uh, a little sleepy during the se- second session, so Gosh, I think sorry. we need to open the coffee table up yeah. next, next time you come in. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, yeah. let's pray for you. If you would want to just extend your hand out yeah, to Stephen, yeah. just pray Please, God's blessing you. on his ministry. Father, thank we thank you so much for Stephen. Thank you. Thank you for this ministry, this important ministry that you've mm. birthed in him and given him this passion, and, and not just the passion, but Lord, you... Um, have instilled with him the gift um, to communicate these wonderful mm. truths, these important truths, Lord. And I pray specifically for him and his family, even mm. as they leave tomorrow mm. for a, a long road trip. Mm. But I just pray for your refreshing. Thank you, Lord. Lord, for your spirit to fill them, you, to protect them. Just I pray that their time together as a family would be sweet. Mm. As they unplug and get away just from Thank just you, the Lord. pressures of life. Mm. Uh, the rhythms of life, I just pray that you would bless them in every way, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Continue to use them for your glory, mm. we pray. Thank you. In Jesus' name, yeah. amen. Amen, my amen. brother. Amen. All right, God bless you guys. You. Stephen will be around for a little yeah. bit longer out in the lobby. I yeah. uh, will see you guys tomorrow morning.